Thank you so much for reading, Sarah. It's lovely to have everyone here. May I say again, and wonderful to have so many with us this morning. As we begin, I'd be very grateful if we kept our Bibles open, just six verses, but there's a lot in there, and I will be referring to these words. Jared has prayed already, so I will begin, and I hope you'll forgive me for beginning with a royal-themed anecdote. I planned this well before the news on Friday. I hope it's not in bad taste, but I suspect if I asked the Queen, she would say, keep calm and carry on. I once came across a documentary that you can find on YouTube called Britain's Real Monarch. It was presented by Tony Robinson. You might remember from the Blackadder series, he played Baldrick. It was all about the discovery that King Edward IV, who ruled England in the 18, uh, 1460s, rather, was actually illegitimate. And therefore, the current line of succession is actually wrong. The key moment comes when Robinson finally arrives at the house of the person who is the rightful heir to the throne, a man called Michael Abney Hastings, who is a farmer from the tiny little New South Wales town, Gerildery, 600 kilometres southeast of where we are here in Sydney. You can imagine the scene, you can watch it. Robinson knocks on the door. Michael says, G'day, Tony, come in. And he still has no idea about what is about to happen. And then Robinson unfurls the family tree on the kitchen table and begins to trace from King Edward all the way down till he lands on the name of his host. And then he says something like this, do you realize just who you are and all that is rightfully yours? The look on his face is all complete surprise. You'll be glad to know that Michael turned out to be a committed Republican with no interest in pursuing the crown, which we're very grateful for. <laughs> do you realize just who you are and all that is rightfully yours? That is the question that Paul has been posing to us in these first three chapters of this magisterial letter to the Ephesians. Do you realize, church, just who you are and all that is rightfully yours? And we've seen that magnificently over the pages of this book. Back in chapter 1, verse 18, Paul prayed that we would have the eyes of our hearts enlightened, opened up, so that we would know what is the hope to which God has called us. And that word call, you'll notice, appears four times in these verses. Verse 1, therefore, a pris I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And then again, in the middle of verse 4, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. God's calling is Paul's way of referring to everything that we've seen in chapters 1 to 3, all that God has made us and all that is rightfully ours. But unlike Michael Abney Hastings, for us as Christians, our calling, who we are, and what God has given us is a reality. We really have been, this morning, blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. As we sit here this morning, we were really once dead in our transgressions and sins, but have been made alive with Christ, raised up with Him, even as we sit physically here in North Sydney, spiritually in the throne room of God. Once bitter enemies of God and with one another, but now reconciled to God and each other as members of Christ's one body with Him as head. As the church, the very dwelling place on earth of the Spirit of God. As the church, the very epicenter of what God is doing in all the cosmos, in drawing all things together in unity under the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure you'll agree that what we see there in chapters 1 to 3 is utterly spectacular. Which brings us back to what Paul says there in just a few words in verse 1. Walk worthy of your calling. If you take notes, that's the first point. Walk worthy of your calling. Verse 1, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. It's a very simple point that Paul is making. Do we see it? We have such an extraordinary calling as Christians. We've been taken from utter muck and given an identity and privileges far, far greater than any human authority or throne in this world. 
And because of that, says Paul, in light of that, walk worthy of your calling. And as a side note, haven't we been given in the Queen, somebody who, as we reflect upon it, so clearly walked worthy of her calling, her calling as Queen, but even more so as a Christian, following in the footsteps of her servant King. So verse 1 really is actually the governing sentence of all of the second half of Ephesians. Chapters 1 to 3, our extraordinary calling. Chapters 4 to 6, what it will look like, practically speaking, to walk worthy of that very, very high calling. And it's just worth noting before we move on from verse 1, a couple of things that Paul says here. First of all, that calling that we have received is 100% secure. We have been called past tense, says Paul. That is an un changeable fact. We were dead, but have been made alive. Another unchangeable fact. We were separated, but we have been united to each other and to Christ. Unchangeable fact. It is as possible for us this morning, if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, to lose our salvation as it is for Jesus to return from the glory of heaven and go back to the grave. I want to just rub that in for us in case we're in any doubt. We do not walk in order to earn our calling. No, we've already been called, and now we walk in response to that secure calling. If you're not a Christian this morning, not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, may I say, that is the wonderful news of the Christian gospel. You do not earn your way into eternal life or into the throne room of heaven. You are called by God as you put your trust in Him. And our works, therefore, our walking is in response to that. Our calling is secure. But also, having said that, it doesn't mean that our walking doesn't matter. Our walking really, really does matter very much indeed. Paul doesn't say, well, walk in a manner worthy of your calling, if you wouldn't mind, possibly. No, he says, I urge you, I urge you, This is the coach at half-time urging his troops. He says it as a prisoner of the Lord. He says so as a man with chains around his wrists, somebody for whom this really cost a lot, his preaching of the gospel that gave them this calling, sent him into prison. Don't take it or leave it, says Paul. Christian this morning, don't take it or leave it. Walk worthy of the extraordinary high calling to which you have been called. And so then the question is, what does that mean? Well, that's the whole back half of this letter. But first and foremost, it means maintaining our unity. Point one, walk worthy of your calling. Point two, by maintaining unity. Very simple, but very profound. Verse three, Paul says, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I have to admit, as I was studying this passage, I was surprised that unity in the church was the very highest, foremost priority of Paul in describing what it means to walk worthy of the calling. But of course, had I paused for a moment to think, that is obviously what he would say, because that is what God has been doing, as we've been seeing in these opening chapters. God's great plan, as we said, to unite all things in this universe under the Lord Jesus Christ the church being the epicenter of that great project, the one place in this world where every us and them has been broken down. And our unity is the display of the manifold wisdom of God to the cosmic powers of this world. We are the pilot project for what God is doing. So therefore, maintaining this precious God bought, God created unity among us is absolutely vital. That is what it means to walk worthy of our calling. Indeed, that is our calling, to maintain our God bought unity. That unity, that oneness, is a reality. There's a great book which is on the bookshelf at the back, I just checked, called Confronting Christianity 12 Hard Questions. For the world's largest religion, written by a lady called Rebecca McLaughlin. It's an excellent book, 
And the second question that she addresses is this, doesn't Christianity crush diversity? Let me read what she says on page 45. She says, if you care about diversity, don't dismiss Christianity. It is the most diverse, multi-ethnic, and multicultural movement in all of history. And that is profoundly true. Our world is desperate, desperately trying to create unity out of so many divisions, but it simply can't. It is an impossible project. But God has done it, and he has done it in his church. No matter what man-made diversity quota or legislation or educational campaign that our world, humanly speaking, tries to bring, it will never, ever do what God alone has done done, genuine unity out of real diversity. And in each individual church across the globe, worshipping God this morning, that is true. The greatest division in humanity, Jew and Gentile, as we've seen in Ephesians, the dividing wall broken down. But beyond that, the divisions between black and white, between Ukrainian and Russian, between young and old, between rich and poor. The world cannot do it, but God has brought that unity. And Paul hammers that home in case we missed it time and time again in these verses. Did you see it there in verses 4 to 6? One, 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 one. Verse 4, we really are one body. Verse 4 again, we really share one spirit the one spirit who dwells among us and in us, enabling us to call God Father and mean it and know it. One body, one spirit, one hope, that hope of the future, of the world as God intends it to be, that future when all things will be brought in unity under the Lord Jesus Christ that has begun now in the church. Verse 5, one Lord Jesus Christ, one Lord There is only one Lord who reigns supreme today, and we share in him as our Lord. One Lord and one faith. That is to say that there is one unchanging faith given to us, deposited in the Scriptures. And where there is a departure from that, which is happening all over the place, from what Christians have always believed, there is no genuine unity. But where Christians believe what the Bible says And what Christians have always believed, genuine unity under one God. One faith and one baptism. It's not referring to one mode of baptism. Indeed, as we have our baptism Sunday, we'll have both adult baptism and infant baptism. That's not the issue. What is being spoken of here is the same spiritual baptism, that reality of being united to the Lord Jesus in his death and in his resurrection as symbolized by the outward sign of baptism. And then to draw it together, Paul says, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. It's impossible to miss his point. We really are one. Each of us this morning, no matter our differences outwardly, brothers and sisters in the same divine family, sharing the same spirit, the same Lord, the same faith, the same Father in heaven. And therefore notice that in verse 4, Paul says we are to maintain that precious unity. It's not for us to create it, it is to maintain it. It could also be translated, that word, guard it. That is, this unity we have are like precious treasure. We are to be bodyguards, as it were, protecting what God has given us. And therefore, it is a tragedy, is it not? And many of us will have experienced this, perhaps, in other situations of division and disunity, which wrecks what God has created in a church. May I say for a moment, I am so grateful for the unity that we have here at St. Thomas's. But I take it that we have these words in the Scriptures because we cannot take such unity for granted. And there are so many issues, some of them profound, others completely trivial, over which we might divide. And the issue is not what will cause the division. The issue isn't the, 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 the cause of division. It's the attitude 
with which we approach that issue, where we might come into conflict with each other. And as we draw to a close, I want to focus on those words there that will help us guard our unity. Those words in verse 2. Humility and gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. How we interact with each other by interacting in this way will protect this God-bought unity. First, humility and gentleness, which go together and are closely related. That first word, humility, doesn't mean being quiet and shy and diffident. It means literally being low-minded, which is the opposite of being high-minded or proud. Division comes when we are those who have a higher regard for our own interests than the interests of the others in our church family and who, with whom we are interacting. Humility and its close cousin, gentleness, which again could be translated meekness. Meekness, which doesn't mean being weak. No, the Lord Jesus was supremely the one who was meek. It means being strong, but choosing to restrain our strength and to use our strength, not to crush others, but to help them. It's the picture of the international rugby prop cradling a newborn baby daughter. Power used to protect and not to pulverize. Humility and gentleness. And next, says Paul, patience. The opposite of impatience, which is the stab of that harsh word. It's the rolling of the eyes, the fed-up sigh, the frustrated frown, which covers over an internal boiling bitterness, which will spread like cancer and kill unity. As we pause for a moment, we think about impatience. It is really spiritual amnesia, isn't it? Because it means we forget the patience God has and continues to have towards us, those who continue to fail Him every day, yet He is utterly forever patient. It assumes that we're better than we are and better than those around us, but that is false. Humility and gentleness, patience. And finally, bearing with one another in love. Love which is the opposite of standing on our rights. Love which is giving up our rights for each other and bearing with one another. And again, the New Testament is so realistic because it assumes that we need these words because we will come into conflict with each other and fail each other. We will frustrate and we will wound. None of these things are natural to us. By nature, we will assert our rights. We won't be humble, but we'll be proud. We won't be gentle, we'll be harsh. We won't be patient, we'll be impatient. We won't bear with one another in love, but disregard one another with selfishness. But what will guard our unity is adopting those attitudes that Paul so beautifully outlines here. I'm conscious of ways that already I will have caused frustration and upset to people. And may I say, all of us will, by nature. But we are to have this attitude of humility and gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, if we are to maintain this beautiful God-bought unity. And what a beautiful picture it is. It is, of course, all the qualities of the Lord Jesus, the one who was supremely humble, humbling himself from the very throne room of heaven to come into our world, supremely gentle towards us, not treating us as our sins deserve, utterly patient with us every day, who bore all of our sin in love. And so what a beautiful picture we have in these verses, just six tight, short verses, which head up what Paul is going to say in the rest of this letter. But profound. We who are God's church at the very epicenter of his plans for the universe, those who display in our unity the manifold wisdom of God, bringing people who are by nature enemies together and under God, the pilot project showing where all of the cosmos is heading in God's timing. Our unity as one body is a reality. The world cannot create it as hard as it tries, but God has done it. And therefore, what a high and significant responsibility for us, even this morning, to walk worthy of that calling, to work, walk worthy of the calling to be united 
as one people under the Lord Jesus Christ. Why are we going to lead us in prayer as we close? I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. We pray, our Heavenly Father, that you would enable us to marvel and genuinely believe in what you have done for us in calling us as your people, as the body, the church. We pray that you would enable us to lift our minds and our hearts to what you have given us. And at the same time, we pray that we would indeed be those committed to walking worthy of this calling and supremely in guarding the unity that you have given us. We pray that for our church here at St. Thomas's. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.